This program is made possible by the partners and friends of Bob Yandian Ministries. Coming up on this episode of Student of the Word. What Paul said to Peter is so true still today. It may not be Jewish legalism today, but it may be religious legalism. Uh, Things that this church does that this church doesn't do. uh, Things that this church sets up on a high pedestal. This is a bad sin. And looking at other churches in judgment, this is what we have today. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Hello and welcome again to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandian. I want to be talking today about a church that actually set a precedent in the book of Acts, and that's the church in Antioch. But what the background for this was, of course, one that was caught up specifically in this was Peter himself and led to an open confrontation argument between Peter and Paul. This is great. It's brought out in the book of Galatians, and that's why I'm offering the book of Galatians, because I'll be teaching you today, if you want to find the passage of Scripture, in Galatians chapter 2, we're going to be taking a look at verses 11 through 21. The church of Jerusalem was, of course, where the church began. The local church began, the first local church. And of course, revival hit that town. Thousands were born again in chapter 2 after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But already problems begin to erupt by the time we get to chapter 6, where the Greek women were being neglected in the church uh, by the overshadowing of the uh, of the of the Jewish women, the older women in the church. They were being treated better than the Gentile women. Where these were the women in the church uh, that were being uh, fed by the church and taken care of the widows. And so, of course, it caused the church to look into the situation. They settled the situation, but it only got worse chapter after chapter. In chapter four, we have Barnabas brought up. And Barnabas was in the church and gave an offering to the church and all this. And he became of reputation there. And then Barnabas later uh, was sent out by the church to go find a place to start another church. But as he went out and began to look around and already was sensing this legalism starting in Jerusalem, he went and, and discovered some saints at Antioch and found out that what it was described in chapter 11 of Acts is he saw the grace of God, experienced the grace of God. And all these Gentiles receiving Jesus as Savior got along with the Jews in the city. And mainly at Antioch, what we have was the switch of Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, we have much more Jews and a few Gentiles. In Antioch, we had almost all Gentiles with a few Jews, but no one seemed to care. And you notice that when these Gentiles got saved, they had no law to turn to. They had not been brought up under the law. And they experienced great freedom in the church. And he had experienced freedom like this since the day of Pentecost. He remembered when the church started early in Jerusalem, how open and transparent and how free the people were to worship God. There was no legalism, but all of a sudden through the days to come, uh, men were when men were asked if they were circumcised. They were told to ask if they were keeping the laws, keeping the Sabbath days, all these things that had been fulfilled under Jesus. They were good in their day, but they taught about Jesus. But once Jesus came, these things were no longer necessary. And so we have later Later on, the, the problem that Peter ran into in chapter 10, where, uh, where the uh, housetop vision came to him to prepare him for a group of people coming from uh, Caesarea, from the house of Cornelius, who was a, who was a Roman. And he was seeking God and been seeking God and asking God to open up a door and tell him about himself. And he, had, and he was told by the Lord, by an angel, that a man named Peter was going to come to him. And on the other end, in Joppa, Peter was on the rooftop at that time and a vision came to him. But the purpose of the vision was to tell him there were Gentiles coming. He was going to go to their house and not to look down on them for being Gentiles. And here was Peter, not that long after the day of Pentecost, already beginning to get this separation inside of himself. Your Gentiles were Jews when God never had that under the new covenant at all. And so with that housetop vision, he went there, the whole house received Jesus as Savior. And uh, then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. But when he got back home, the church of Jerusalem called him in to chew him out. What were you doing at the house of Gentiles? Were you eating at the house of Gentiles? And he had to get past the whole eating incident, you know, and bring out the fact that, well, I went to this these people and they were Gentiles, but they were seeking after God. And they got filled with the Holy Spirit. They were all born again. Miraculous things happened. And so they had to actually, they actually apologized at that time. And so, but the church kept getting worse and worse till finally something had to happen. And Barnabas, who went out and discovered all these wonderful things of grace 
Cornelius at Antioch sent for Paul, and both of them together helped start a church at Antioch. And the church in Antioch flourished. It was free from religion and free from the law and free from the uh, keeping of the law, all the different things that happened there. And there was no legalism at the church. And so the church flourished so much that the word got back to Jerusalem again, and they got so angry at Jerusalem, they sent Peter out to spy on him. And Peter came there, and this is the story about when he came to Antioch, and Paul reminded him of it because the double theme of the book of Galatians written to Gentiles who were now trying to act like Jews, were keeping the Jewish Sabbath, keeping the feast days, the fast days, all the different things they were doing. Paul ministered to them on salvation and spirituality by grace versus the law. You're saved by grace, you become spiritual by grace. You're not saved by works, nor are you kept spiritual by works. What caught you in the door will keep you going And he simply brings that out in this book. And again, having begun in the spirit, that's salvation by grace, are you now made perfect by the flesh? And that is spirituality by the law. Of course, the answer is no. So Antioch, again, was a young church, thriving church. They understood the principles of grace taught by Paul and Barnabas to them up until this point that's in this chapter. It had far surpassed the Jerusalem church. So the great evangelistic missionary push now coming to the world came from Antioch and missionaries were coming out and churches were being started from the church at Antioch. So Jerusalem sent a delegation to see why the Antioch church was doing so well. And the problem at Jerusalem was legalism since the Jewish headquarters was there. But instead of sending the whole group at once, they sent Peter out ahead and later we're going to send some other representatives from the church at Jerusalem. But here's the point. Look with me at verse 11. Now, when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Paul knew the facts before he faced. Peter. Peter is the first of a delegation coming to Antioch, and Peter's understanding of grace was seen earlier in the Jerusalem meeting over him going to the Cornelius' house. And this was all back in chapter 10 and chapter 11 that this was going on. And because of all this controversy, again, in chapter 11, we find later on that Barnabas began to go out. That's when he found Antioch, and that's when he decided to start a church, and that's when he called Paul to come over and help him do this. And here's the point in verse 12. It says, for before that certain came from James, that's the rest of the convoy coming over to check out this church, he, that is Peter, did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them that were of the circumcision. Let me just give this story here. Peter had come down from Jerusalem, was housed with Gentile members of the church. There was no hotels at that time. And and most of the hotels were, they would steal your money and they would rip you off and all that. So the thing of it is, is when you came to a certain place, especially Christians, they would send letters ahead of time. Paul made reference to this. It was found in the book of Acts. And Paul made reference to this later to the Corinthian church. And they would send a letter and they would bring a letter. And Peter would bring a letter from the church of Jerusalem saying, he's coming here, could you house him? And people would put him in their own homes. But of course, most of the homes in this area of Antioch were Gentiles and they didn't eat Jewish food. They ate Gentile food. So again, Peter had come down from Jerusalem and was now being housed with Gentile members of the church. Peter, of course, ate meals with them and he ate Gentile food, pork and shrimp and bacon. I'm sure he got up one morning and, you know, said, what is this? He said, well, it's eggs and bacon. He goes, oh, and he looked around and said, okay, well, I'll try it. And thought, this is the best stuff I've ever had. Had some shrimp, best stuff I've ever had. Pork, everything was great that he was eating. And this was forbidden under the law, but probably his house stop vision came back to him. He remembered what God had showed him and that this is representing people. And these people eat these food, but you know what? There is no food taboos in the New Testament, only under the law. And it was only to teach about Jesus Christ and the purity of Jesus coming. So he began to eat these things and found it and then went to church. Oh my Lord, when he went to the church, he saw the freedom of the people there. They began to worship God, praise him. There was nothing about coming through the door and asking if you're circumcised, if you're a man, if you're a woman, you've been paying uh, tithes of all of your uh, spices, mint, anise, cumin. If you're paying tithes of those things, all the different things. Peter so enjoyed the church and the freedom of the church in Antioch, he forgot to report back to Jerusalem and Jerusalem didn't hear from him for some times. So, So James sent a legalistic group of Jews to check up on Peter. 
And when Peter was at the church and then saw these men coming into the church, he went back and withdrew from that home out of fear of the Gentiles, out of fear of the Jews, and would not fellowship with the Gentiles in the church. Peter caused a church split between the Jews and the Gentiles. Look with me at verse 13. And other Jews dissembled, played the hypocrite, Likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas was also carried away with their dissimulation, as the King James says, or their hypocrisy. The word for dissemble in the King James is translated played the hypocrite in the New King James, and that's exactly what it is. The Greek word is hypocrites. The Greek word for hypocrite, hypocrites, means to speak from behind a mask. It was the mask that was used in the plays of Greek of the Greeks. And so the, those masks, you know, one of them had a big smile on it, one had a big face on it, a uh, big uh, frown on it. And it simply showed whether this was going to be a comedy or a tragedy. And it showed the mood to all those. But the one who spoke from behind the mask was called a hypocrite. The word hypocrite means to speak from behind a mask. In other words, the hypocrite had two faces. He had his own, plus he had the mask that he said in front of his face. And so this is where, again, we get the fact that we are two faces. Peter was two-faced at that time. Although he was showing a face to the people with a big smile on it, and he was enjoying himself by the time all of a sudden that the hypocrites came, the other hypocrites came, he put a mask in front of his face and showed himself to be completely different than what he was. When Peter came there, he actually could be free like he hadn't been free before. But when these men came from Jerusalem, he played the part of the hypocrite, so much so that it says Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. Here's the point. Barnabas was the pastor of the church. For Barnabas to be swept up by this hypocrisy is really saying something because he was a champion of grace. He later is in line with Paul and is out of line over Mark. So Barnabas later was correct in taking care of Mark and Paul was wrong for wanting to separate from Mark. This is all found in Acts chapter 15, verses 35 through 41, because Paul would not take Mark a second time because he deserted them in Pamphylia the first time. Barnabas stood up for Mark and Barnabas was right. And Paul later admitted he was wrong about Mark and also admitted that he needed him in Colossians chapter four and verse one in 2 Timothy chapter four and verse 11. But in this story, Peter's separation from the Gentiles called, caused even the pastor to play the part of a hypocrite. Peter's one decision to separate from the Gentiles caused a split in the church between the Jews and the Gentiles to where even the pastor Barnabas chose the side of the Gentiles because the constant pull of hypocrisy under the law was always there. And so we have that. And so we learn from this story. And what we're gonna find from this story is the argument, we'll take it up in the second half of this broadcast, is what Paul said to Peter is so true still today. It may not be Jewish legalism today, but it may be religious legalism. Uh, things that this church does, that this church doesn't do, uh, things that this church sets up on a high pedestal, this is a bad sin, and looking at other churches in judgment, this is what we have today. What this is mainly teaching us today is this, we need to get away from, from running down other people, looking at people through our religious glasses and understand if they're born again, Jesus Christ loves them. And there's just different as we have to put up with. In fact, I am convinced when we get to heaven, Jesus is going to have to straighten all of us out. And in the second half of this broadcast, I want you to really take notice because if you're a pastor, a leader in a church, perhaps your church is getting into some of these things and you can begin to pull back from these things and let the grace of God begin to abound in your church. I will see you right after the break. The Apostle Paul knew that works can't bring salvation. The Galatian churches, after believing the gospel of grace in Christ, were misled into Jewish law. Paul wrote to them, confronting their foolishness. His letter declared salvation by faith alone, not based on effort or observance, but solely upon the grace of God. In this New Testament commentary on Galatians, Bob Yandian defines legalism, its effects on the Galatians, and its impact on today's church. Seeing how legalism infected the Galatian churches we can learn to overcome this subtle attack on believers today. To order this New Testament commentary on Galatians, visit our website at bobyandian.com. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, 
This teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. Pastors, if you would like to schedule Bob Yandian to speak at your church, event, or conference, go to bobyandian.com forward slash invite. Let's go back to Galatians chapter 2, and we're going to start in verse 14. And while you're finding that, let me just say very quickly to those who love this broadcast, support this broadcast, and love me and support me. Thank you so much. Jesus had a group of people that supported him. Paul mentioned quite often those partners that, play, that stayed with him and, and stood with him during the difficult times. He was speaking specifically to those that were in the church at Philippi, the strongest church that stood with him as partners. In fact, partnership is a major theme that runs through the book of Philippians. Five times partnership is mentioned. People often say, where do you get this word partnership? It's found in the word of God. It's translated from the word ko- koinonia, which means fellowship, but you cannot have fellowship together without having partnership. And so not only do we have partnership with each other, but we have a common fellowship from our heart toward each other. Even though I have never met about 95% of you that are partners with me, I may not see you on earth, but I'll be rejoicing with you in heaven. I'll recognize you immediately when we get to heaven and we'll get to see the accomplishments of our works, of our giving, of our ministry of the word of God for whatever I do. You are a partner in fellowship with me. And I thank you so much. On a monthly basis, you not only pray for me, but you give financially. And I want to thank you for that. If you're not a partner with me, I'd love for you to be a partner with me, to join me in the presentation of the Word of God, the teaching of this message of grace, but also the teaching of the message of faith, and also to help bring up disciples in this generation. Because what the world needs is not just converts. They need strong disciples, those who are stable in the things of God. That's what we're out to do. So go to my website, bobyandian.com. You'll find a place there where you can become a partner with me. Thank you ahead of time for joining. Let's take a look again in this particular story. Peter's separation from the Gentiles called even the pastor Barnabas to play a part in their hypocrisy. In verses 14 through 21, we're going to have what Paul said to Peter. As a result of this argument in front of the congregation, legalism was broken in Antioch and the believers were straightened out. The legalists went back to Jerusalem and swore they would get Paul. They spent the next 30 years trying to stop him. They followed him everywhere, Iconium, Derby, Lystra, trying to tear down his new foundations. And they literally found, especially after the book of Galatians, they found a way to come and get Paul. And that is he would, they would wait for him to leave. And once he left, they would come in and begin to undermine him and use Old Testament verses to undermine Paul and bring these people under legalism, even Gentile believers who never had the law in the first place. And without rightly dividing it, they would come back and put them under it. In other words, they didn't want to see people get saved. Their main thing was getting people under the law. And especially the big trophy they had was getting Gentiles to keep the law. And so they called them proselytes. And Jesus even warned them. He said, you go into all the nations and make proselytes out of all them. Bring them back home and make them twofold more the child of hell than you are yourself. This is found in Matthew chapter 23. So again, we have this and here's an exact example of it in the book of Galatians. But let's keep on going in verse 14. When I saw, this is Paul speaking, that they did not walk uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, if you, being a Jew, live after the manner of Gentiles now that you're here and not as do the Jews, then why do you compel the Gentiles now to live as Jews? In other words, if you were born a Jew and have now turned to the ways of the Gentiles and forsaken Jewish ways, why do you now ask these Gentiles to live like Jews or practice Judaism? In other words, Peter, make up your mind. Were you right as a Jew or are you right as a Gentile? If you're right as a Gentile, why put the Gentiles under Jewish molds, making them like you were before? Besides, what about your housetop vision? This was found in Acts chapter 10, verses 9 through 48, this incredible housetop vision where the Lord brought to him in this vision, put all kinds of unclean animals and said, here, rise up, Peter, slay these and and prepare them and eat them. He said, no, Lord, I wouldn't do that. And the Lord began to show him, you're looking at these things that the 
law taught, but now you're looking at Gentiles as unclean. And God said, I, n- I never have and do not look as Gentiles as unclean. And what he was simply telling him was, get your thinking straight toward Gentiles. And that's when he went to the house of Cornelius. Now he's coming back to this and finding such incredible freedom in a church. Before this, he found Gentiles open in a house of Cornelius to the gospel. They got saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. Now he's going to a church that's established on these principles. He walked into that church, uh, Peter did, and saw things he hadn't seen since the day of Pentecost. Man, the freedom that's here. I've never seen this before. He says, I've forgotten all about it. And then the housetop vision came back to him. And then again, when those, those Jews came from Jerusalem, he immediately became fearful and backed off and removed himself from the Gentiles and helped split the entire church. His one act of legalism split the church right down the middle to where even Barnabas joined in with him. And it took Paul taking Peter in front of the entire congregation to chew him out. This is not something you normally do. God has never asked you to take and have your arguments in front of people. You have them behind the scenes. But because Peter's uh, stand in legalism, split the entire church. What Paul said to Peter, well, he was saying it to everybody that was there, including the pastor Barnabas. The Jews were given the law and thought they were automatically saved because they were something special with God. And they thought all Gentiles were unsaved simply because they were not born Jews. Now Peter has picked up this mentality, separating himself for something they had nothing to do with. Listen to me, I don't care what nationality you are. I don't care what color you are. I don't care if you're male or female, you had no choice in this. We're told in the book of Acts that God has made of one blood all nations, and he simply picked where you were to be born, what uh, boundaries you were to be born in, and even what time period you were born in. The nationality, you had no choice. You had no choice. When you were born in this earth, God placed you into a body. That body could have been black or white. It could have been male or female. It could have been uh, oriental. Hispanic. It could have been anything like that. On top of that, you didn't have a choice as what time period you were born in, what city you were born in, what country you were born in, your socioeconomic background, none of that stuff you had a choice in. And if God puts you into a body, he must have a plan for you and your color must not detract from it at all. Apparently, your nationality doesn't detract from it at all. Your gender doesn't detract from it at all. And here is Peter walking into this church saying, your color matters, your your nationality matters. God favors Jews over Gentiles, and that has never been the case. And so this all comes back under the doctrine of the law. And I've got teaching on the law. In fact, it's brought out in this book on the subject and on the book of Galatians. Verse 16 goes on to say, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we, Peter and Paul and the Jew, and the Jews have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by faith in Christ, not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. The legalists are saying to these people that Paul is taking them away from the law and by so doing, they can't be saved. These legalists are actually coming to them telling them, look, if Paul is preaching that you don't keep the law, but we know the law is what makes you holy, then he's trying to get you not to be saved. And later they are taking the purpose of the law and twisting it because the law was never designed as a means of salvation. It was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. It was to teach the Jewish people and it was only given to the nation of Israel. It was to teach the people through the law who Jesus Christ was and why he had to come because we're born sinners and we need a savior. That's the law. We can't keep it. We're born sinners. But the sacrifices tell us what the answer to it is. It's Jesus Christ. And once the people looked at the law and saw Jesus Christ, then the, then the law backed off. It was only a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Once we come to Christ, we are no longer under the schoolmaster. So again, the legalists were saying to the people, Paul is taking them away from the law and by so doing, now they can't get saved. And Paul says, no, quite the opposite. I'm taking them away from the law so they now know that the means of salvation is Jesus Christ. I'm in perfect line with the law. Verse 17 says, but if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are also found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? He comes back and says, let me tell you what these legalists are teaching. These legalists are teaching, say, well, we are justified and saved by Jesus, but then we have to turn to the law. But the purpose of the law is to show us we're sinners. So did Jesus Christ Christ save us, put us back under the law to show us we're sinners again. That makes Jesus the minister of sin. God forbid. What he's saying was having begun in grace, you continue in grace. 
having begun in the Holy Spirit, you continue in the Holy Spirit by being saved by faith, simply by the grace of God. You keep walking in faith simply by the faith of God. In other words, it comes back to the verse of scripture, the just, those who have been saved by grace shall now be led by grace. The just shall live by faith. Faith got you in, faith keeps you going. So here's what Peter's life by now, speaking to the congregation at Antioch, here's what Peter is saying. As a sinner, I was under the law. Then I got saved and I was under grace. But now as a disciple, I'm back under the law. No, that's what it's not saying. Otherwise, again, Jesus becomes the minister of sin. In other words, Peter, were you right under grace or you're right under law? Verse 17 tells me that if I am, tells me if I am right now, then while I'm seeking justification through Christ and keeping the law, then I find a contradiction. The law teaches me that I am now a sinner after I have been saved. Romans chapter 3 and verse 20 brings this out, and this would make Christ the minister of sin, and this is blasphemy. Verse 18, for if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Notice God isn't making you a transgressor. You make yourself a transgressor by trying to go back under the Old Testament keeping of the law. I want to qualify one thing. Understanding the law and going back and studying it is wonderful, but you understand it and study it as God intended it, pointing to Jesus Christ. But you're not saved by it and you're not kept by it. If the law was wrong, and I was under grace, then to rebuild the law would make me a transgressor. I can make myself a transgressor by trying to keep the law after I am saved, but Jesus Christ cannot make me a transgressor. It would be against everything heaven stands for. And in verse 19, for I through the law am dead to the law that I might live to God. Notice the law is not dead. I am dead to it if I try to keep it. If you try to live by the law, it kills you, but that's good. Now you're usable for God. Verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. That's perfect tense. I have been crucified from the moment I received him as Lord and Savior. I am crucified with Christ, but yet nevertheless I live. Yet not I that live. It's Christ that lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In other words, again, the just shall live by faith. Christ who lives in me is producing in me. The law of the Spirit of Christ in Christ Jesus makes us free from the law of sin and death. Look at verse 21. I do not frustrate, void, or cancel the grace of God. For if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Peter, by your actions, you first say Christ is the minister of sin, verse 17. Now you say Jesus died in vain. By the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be justified in his sight. So by the deeds of the law, no flesh shall remain justified in his sight. We begin in grace. We continue in grace. We start in faith. We continue in faith. Praise Jesus. Thank God for the grace of God. See you next time. Ministers, you can access valuable resources free at ministersclub.com. You'll find topical studies, sermon outlines, PDF books, answers to many questions, and plenty of encouragement. All free. Just go to ministersclub.com. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.